Within the world of Yu-Gi-Oh, there's a lot of lore that goes without any mention. Today, I wanted to really speak about, talk about, one of the more interesting lore trees I was able to research. And from that research, I have done in the information I could find, this is the story of the world of prophecy. The story begins way before prophecy, far before any spellcasters or witches. It begins with God living in the sanctuary in the sky, with the angels, Pandora, Parshath, and many others. One day, Pandora finds the forbidden items, the lance, chalice, scripture, and dress. She uh, fucks with them, finds the power that they hold. Um, God is obviously very unhappy with her ignoring his warnings, as use of all the forbidden items strictly prohibited uh, within the sanctuary, and thus he prompts his judgment and strikes her down from his sanctuary. Following these events, Pandora becomes the condemned witch, and with her new form and newfound evil, she calls upon Lucifer and his army of Dark Lords to attack God and basically wages a holy war. The war is obviously not an easy one. Lucifer leads his troops to battle, and bloody war ensues as you, as you would expect. However, despite being aligned with Lucifer, midway through the war, one of God's fallen angels, Nastin, betrays Lucifer and returns to God's aid. Nastin coming back to God is depicted within the artwork of the cards Dark Lord Contact as well as the Sanctified Dark Lord. The power of Nastin and God's armies together is enough to defeat Lucifer's troops, thankfully. Having lost a lot of his strength after the Holy War, God entrusts some of his powers to a prophet, passing his child Alistair the first spellbook, the Book of the Law. Alistair, on Earth, uses the power granted by the Book of the Law to invoke monstrous gods from unknown worlds with his spells. He is the only known spellcaster to have mastered the forbidden arts of invocation. However, during an experiment, Alistair accidentally merges himself with one of the gods he tends to invoke, leaving him in a state of limbo, plugged up to a magical power source under the Grand Spellbook Tower, hardly alive. Fast forward to years after this. The Grand Spellbook Tower is the meeting place for many great spellcasters around the world. There are many libraries within this tower, and it contains many of the spellbooks displayed in the artwork of the spellbook spell cards. These spellbooks seem to be the way this world records information, holding powerful secrets and concepts within them. This is said to be the way they record and update information. The magical stones at the heart of each individual spellbook is the smoothest possible way of updating and maintaining so much magical information and knowledge. Within the Great Spellbook Tower, wisdom itself is recorded into the books for the students to observe and learn for their ventures into the outside world. Within the Grand Spellbook Tower, there is the Library of the Heliosphere which holds spellbooks that are used purely for information and are read by pretty much the typical spellcaster. It includes information on history, medicine, basic technology. These books are, for the most part, public domain and common knowledge. Within the Grand Spellbook Tower, there's also the Library of the Crescent. This library contains a permanent collection of spellbooks that no one but members of the Guild of Prophecy can access centering around combat technology and the quests of other spellcasters throughout history. We also see the Spellbook Star Hall within the Grand Spellbook Tower. This hall depicts the large power stone that accumulates magic energy from the atmosphere to power the Grand Spellbook Tower. This stone is similar to the small power stones depicted within the spell books. We can obviously assume that the massive scale of this stone means that the magical energy being accumulated by the tower is of an incredible magnitude. There are a number of important spellcasters within the world of prophecy. It can be assumed that the Empress and Emperor of Prophecy rule over the information flow within the Guild of Prophecy, directing and controlling the more powerful spellcasters within their guild. The most powerful spellcasters seem to be the ones who reside within the Guild of Prophecy, aka those who are allowed within the Library of the Crescent. These members are displayed within the artwork of the Prophecy cards as the following. The Amoress of Prophecy, the Charioteer of Prophecy, the Fool of Prophecy, the Hermit of Prophecy, the Justice of Prophecy, the Magician of Prophecy, the Wheel of Prophecy, the Strength of Prophecy, the Stoic of Prophecy, the Temperance of Prophecy, 
and, of course, the high priestess of prophecy. It is also notable that the Prophecy Destroyer is depicted within Spellbook of Knowledge as being a part of this guild at one point. It can be assumed that after being granted some amount of power, Prophecy Destroyer was absorbed by it and lashed out against his fellow spellcasters and was cast out of the kingdom. He is depicted as residing within a dark cavern far from the kingdom within his own artwork. The name also gives a hint that he most certainly is not not any longer an ally of the Guild of Prophecy, but at one point he most likely was. The Fool of Prophecy is the character with the deepest storyline within the Prophecy archetype. The Fool is part of the Guild of Prophecy, and though he has studied many of the powerful texts in the Library of the Crescent, he lives his life for the most part carefree, without motivation, will to do anything with the knowledge he holds and the potential that he possesses. This character is a reflection of the tarot card, the Fool, who, just like the Fool of Prophecy, has great potential, but generally puts it to waste. The citizens of Prophecy lived peacefully alongside one another, until the king of the magical citadel, Endymion, decided that his philosophy did not line up with the students of the Grand's public tower. Endymion believed that the Guild of Prophecy shared information far too freely with their students and the general public. He tried to seize control of the Grand's public tower to limit the spread of magical information. And thus, Endymion and his soldiers then went to war with the, the Guild of Prophecy for power over the spellbooks. As others from the Guild fought the soldiers of Endymion, putting their lives on the line, the Fool searched the libraries for power, able to overtake his enemies. In his research, the Fool finds a hidden spellbook within the Library of the Crescent. When the Fool came across the spellbook of the Master, the power was far greater than he had anticipated. His potential exploded within him, and his latent power took over. This transformation turned him into the Reaper of Prophecy. With his newfound power, the Reaper took lives from all who stood around him, slaughtering the Endymion army along with his former allies. The darkness had overtaken him entirely. The Endymion forces retreated in the face of the Reaper, however his power still raged out of control. Brimming with this unfathomable power, the Reaper was growing close to death. Depicted in the Spellbook of Fate, the Guild had to make a decision on how to deal with the darkness erupting within their kingdom. The Guild met to converse about how to solve this issue. Eventually, the Guild Council came to a consensus. They used the sacred spell of judgment to cleanse the darkness from the reaper, leaving a pure and holy soul left in his wake. This transformation is depicted within the Spellbook of Miracles. The reaper transforms now into the world of prophecy. The world of prophecy is depicted as a deity-type being with insane power, with a pure soul determined to fight for good. This thus ends the saga of the Fool of Prophecy and that chapter in the Spellbook history. Thank y'all for listening along. This was actually a super cool video to research and to try and piece together. The Yu-Gi-Oh! lore is obviously a lot more in-depth than I had ever previously thought. Uh, obviously, a lot of this is up to interpretation because all we really have is artwork and no official Konami statements, but uh, I, I pieced together as much as I could, and I hope you guys can take the um, artistic liberties um, as they are, in fact, artistic liberties. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed, and until next time, thank you, and goodbye.